Well, thank you all. And uh, I just want to jump right into it today. We, uh, we are going to be having a conversation about the important uh, topic of election integrity. And uh, uh, just uh, so excited to have Ken here joining us, uh, offering his expertise on this. Gil uh, read some of his bio. Ken, you've been tracking this uh, issue very closely, uh, working on this election integrity issue very closely. Uh, but Ken also is a, a former Secretary of State in the state of Ohio. So he has uh, overseen elections, been the top state election official and in Ohio, which is a state that historically has seen um, lots of close and very, very important uh, elections. So just so uh, so uh, uh, grateful for his expertise and, and insight on this. Um, I know this is an issue everybody's been been paying close attention to, but just a, a quick background on this issue. So this is uh, this is something that We've seen a lot more uh, attention go towards this issue recently, but it's not really a new issue. Election integrity has been something that's been being talked about for a long time. It's always been a very important thing. You look at, at last year and what happened, uh, we had COVID hit. We had a lot of states change their laws in the name of COVID. Uh, at that point, we had a lot of people speak up and say, you know, some of these changes are being pushed too fast. Uh, these aren't being well vetted, expressing some concerns. Uh, then we had the election last year, and we had the, the questions that came up, the irregularities we saw, which puts us in the, the present context we're in. Um, and uh, so we have, we have action happening on this issue at both the federal uh, side of things and the state side of things. We want to get into both of those today. Both are very, very important. Um, there's been a move by some of the state legislatures to deal with the issues we saw. There's been other movements to make permanent some of those changes that were done in the name of COVID. And then we have what's been happening at the federal level uh, to change things there as well. So Ken, I'd like to start off maybe at the federal level with you. Um, this year, we've heard an awful lot about this, this federal legislation, HR1, or uh, they, they call it the For the People Act. Some people call it the, the Corrupt Politicians Act. But this was a, pr a priority uh, right out of the gate this year for Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi. It passed the House earlier this year, has only stopped in the Senate because the filibuster is still in place. Could you give us your thoughts on, on HR1? What, what would it do? Why should people be concerned about it? HR1 and S1, which is the Senate version, would affect a federal takeover of our election system. Let me put something in historical context. The great philosopher Aristotle said that there was a dynamic tension between the organized power of the state and individual liberty. The more muscular the state, the less individual liberty we have. And so the framers of our Constitution put a harness on the reach and the power of the federal government. It decentralized that, that power uh, because they know the absolute, they knew the absolute power con corrupts absolutely. And so what they, what they did was to say, we are coming out from under the influence of a monarchy uh, and we want to give our free citizens power to hold elected officials accountable. And so consequently, what they did was they invested in state governments the power to determine the place, uh, time, and manner of elections. Uh, H1S1 is a, an attempt of a federal government to pull that power back into a concentrated effort at the federal level. What we know is that this, this is an attempt to, in fact, give one party control over the, the elections. It would convert us from free citizens to subjects again. And so that's why resistance to this transformation of our decentralized system into a centralized system is so important. But I also want to put something in context. Um, this is the same clown car that wants to wreck our, our economy, wants to open our borders, wants to create a system of voters without borders, 
uh, and as a consequence, they want to fundamentally transform our, our constitutional republic. So resistance is very important. So that's why we've been working to stop the passage of S-1 or S-1, because in simple form, it is nothing more than a federal takeover of our election system uh, at a time when there's Pelosi and Schumer and others are trying to concentrate power in the hands of a federal government that they, they hope to make one party control. Ken, I'd like to follow that up with a question about H.R. 4. So we've had uh, H.R. 1, S. 1, which th was the first priority, again, that passed the House, is, is stalled in the Senate. More recently, we've seen, um, we've seen the left pivot to a push for H.R. 4. And I, I use the word pivot uh, somewhat cautiously. We still know that H.R. 1 remains a priority, but um, H.R. 4 is something they're now trying to see if they can get through. Um, as they've pivoted, we've heard a lot more about this uh, pre-clearance word, something I wasn't very familiar with before as it relates to state election laws. Um, and I know we just had a hearing yesterday in the Senate that you monitored on, the, on this type of legislation. Could you speak to that? Is H.R. 4 actually much different than H.R. 1? And what do you think the chances of it actually getting passed are? You could put lipstick on a pig. <laughs> it's still a pig. And H.R. 4 is nothing more than bad legislation with lipstick on it. Uh, it, is, it is rooted in this notion that America in 1619 was founded in racism. So that's why it is not apart from critical race theory. Their notion is that states don't have the wherewithal to conduct free and fair elections because some states in the past have had a history of discriminatory practices against minorities, most notably, most notably blacks. The reality is that there have been major reforms since 1965. And in 1965, about 11 states were, and some other jurisdictions were put under uh, the authority of the, the Department of Justice. And before they could make any changes in their election laws, uh, they had to get pre, it, those changes had to be pre-cleared by the Justice Department. Again, that was central government, federal government control. H.R. 4 uh, is a, uh, a version of this federal takeover initiative that would say, uh, in effect, any state that wanted, not just the 11, original 11 states, but any state that wanted to make major changes in their election laws would have to get pre-clearance from the Department of Justice now under control by a a flaming uh, status leftist bad news attorney general. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so it, it is it is it is it is it is bad legislation. Uh, again, it, it this is this is to concentrate power uh, in, in in the federal government, uh, and this is their 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 route to do it. Again, it's the same clown card that tells parents they have no role in the education of their children. They're now telling state governments, precinct workers, that, and free citizens that you have no voice in your governance structure. Uh, it is a conversion from a constitutional republic to a, a, an authoritarian federal government with centralized power uh, that destroys our, our individual li liberties. So that's why we have to fight back. Look, the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass said it best. And if there's nothing else that I say to you, I want you to carry this home. Frederick Douglass said, those who are whooped easiest are whooped most often. We must resist this attempt to fundamentally transform our country. Uh, there are folks who, again, want open borders, parents out of the influence of their education, and citizens out of the governance structure of our country. Same playbook, 
same bad actors, we must resist, we must fight. Ken, I'd like to pivot to um, the state legislation. As you alluded to earlier, you know, constitutionally, the states have the authority to, to set these times and, and places and, and these rules surrounding elections and election integrity. And we have actually seen quite a bit of action at the state level this year. Um, the last numbers I've seen are that we've had over 400 bills uh, at the state level introduced in 49 states to somehow strengthen election integrity, which is a great number, shows a lot of momentum, but it's not just they, that they've been introduced, there are at least 18 states that have actually passed some sort of uh, legislation that would strengthen election integrity. Um, Georgia has probably been the most visible, but there's a lot of other states as well, Florida, Arizona, Texas, a host of other states. So I'd like to get your take on the, on the um, the state movement. What's your take on that overall? And do you feel like people should be encouraged by what the state legislatures have done so far? We should be encouraged. And we'll sort of pivot off of the last panel uh, where they concentrated on our military. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about election systems. Give you a case in point. Most states now are concerned about two tracks of activities. One, the chain of custody of ballots. It is proven throughout history that the tighter the chain of custody of a ballot, meaning that chain that, that exists between when a voter fills out his or her ballot and when it is counted, the tighter it is, the more secure the system. The other thing is verification practices and policies, determining that voters are who they claim to be. And so one of the great movements across the country is for voter photo ID. And, and that is something that is paramount. What that federal legislation would do would be to erase, you know, that requirement from most uh, state operations and election systems. Let me give you a case in point. I'm, I've been blessed. I had a great uncle who was the first black American to win an Olympic gold medal in track and field in 1924. He, <laughs> he did it uh, in, the, in the long jump. He was to run against Eric Little of Chariots of Fire fame in the 100. But when he got to Paris, he was told after a transatlantic debate with Eric Little as to which one of them was the fastest human being on the face of the earth, he said he was told by the International Olympic Committee that the 100-yard dash was a white-only event. And so he couldn't run. But he said God blessed him because he was able to win a gold medal, but he was able to witness Eric Little's fidelity to his faith. And, and, and so fidelity to faith became a big issue. Uh, this is a long story. I'll, I'll shrink it up. He got back to Cincinnati, uh, and he expanded not whole baseball was one of the founders of the American Negro Baseball League and and so that legacy was passed on to me I am now a shareholder of the, the Cincinnati Reds now it, it, it was it was it was just crazy as a former election official to hear Major League Baseball Delta Airlines Coca-Cola basically say that voter a requirement for a voter photo ID was racist and a go back to Jim Crow. And therefore, they started to penalize election officials across the country who were requiring a photo ID. Let me tell you, Brent, if I was to leave you win, uh, tickets for a Reds game at the will call window, what would you have to show to get those tickets? Photo ID, I'm guessing. That's absolutely right. Can you imagine? I'm almost a three million miler with Delta. Can you imagine me going up to the ticket counter saying, and then when they ask me for my voter, uh, photo ID, I say, oh, no, here's my utility bill. <laughs> you know, I can't get in to see the officials at Coca-Cola in their offices without a photo ID. And so state after state, we've pushed back against this nonsense. 
And so voter ID is a, a very important part of making sure that a voter is who he or she claims to be. Ken Kukowski and I did a, 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 a piece for the, Har for the uh, Yale Law Review in 2009 talking about the other voter rights. The other duty of citizenship is to be able to do common sense things that will make sure that the integrity of our elections is in place and voter confidence in the results go up. There is nothing more important to do, whether it's in Virginia, Ohio, or California, is to push for photo IDs for voters. That is, in fact, a must. And we can't not continue to push for that. And it, it does your freedom, the integrity of your, your freedom and the election system turns on your ability to spend a little political capital in making sure that photo IDs happen across America. Pure and simple. Making sure that there is coverage in every precinct. And again, I will tell you, Virginia is the first state up right now this November. Make sure that every precinct has eyeballs. Two sets of eyeballs looking at how voters are, 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 are verifying that they are who they claim to be and that their ballots or cast legally. John 3, there's a passage. Those who would do evil love the darkness. Any force, any group, any individual that resists transparency in our elections is up to evil. Each of us need to go to those passages in the Bible that tell us that God has lit our candle and we're not to hide that candle under a bushel. We are in fact, we are in fact obligated to put that candle on a candlestick, lift it high and pierce the darkness of our time. That's what this is all about. This is not just a political war. This is a spiritual fight, and we cannot forget this. It is what, what is at risk? It's the very nature of our constitutional republic and the understanding that the founders made and had when they wrote that second paragraph in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. And my dad used to say, that's a highfalutin way of saying any knucklehead should be able to get this. <laughs> that we're endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, which means that our freedoms, our rights, our dignity are not grants from government. They're gifts from God. Mm -hmm. And I have traveled the world. I have traveled the world. And one of the things that General Boykin, who I call Junior because I'm about three months older than he is, <laughs> he will tell you that in totalitarian, authoritarian states, one of the ways that states gain power is that they, in fact, make their subjects believe that their freedom is determined by them and not a higher being God. And that's why the fact that they're trying to run God and faith out of the public square, and they're trying to crush the incubator of liberty, our families, are part and parcel of the same design that's trying to gain federal control over our election systems. It is to put our individual liberty at risk and to beat us into submission of not being free citizens, but subjects. We must fight back. And we must do it through common sense practices, photo ID, tight chain. We need to get back 
to understanding why we have election day and that's been part of our history. We don't, we, they didn't start off saying we have election month or election six weeks. They wanted election day at the precinct level because that's friends helping friends. It does two things, tightens the chain of custody and it helps with voter verification. It, you come in, you say, oh, hi, I'm Brent. And I say, oh, no, you're not Brent. I've been knowing Brent for about five years and I live next door to him. That's why the precinct is so important. We need to get back to it. We need to claw back as much of that calendar as we can. And we need to make sure that there are verification systems that are in place. Mm. Ken, I'd like to uh, briefly get your thoughts on the audits. We saw Arizona recently complete one, Maricopa County. We've seen other states that are in the process Texas recently announced that they're going to be doing that. What are your thoughts on those? And do you think those have been helpful in kind of uh, uncovering and addressing some of the issues that have surfaced over the last 12 months? I think audits are, are important because after this election, there were some things that made me go, huh? <laughs> Donald Trump got 11 million more votes in 2020 than he had received in 2016. He became the first president to win more votes in his reelection than his initial election to lose. That made me say, huh? Biden set a record number of votes cast for him, for him uh, with, with 83 uh, million votes. But he won a record low 17% of the counties in this country. I said, huh? <laughs> there are 19, over the last 40 years, there are 19 bellwether counties in the country. For the last 40 years, the president, uh, the candidate that has won the majority of those counties won the presidency. Donald Trump won 18 of the 19 and lost. Things that made me say, huh? <laughs> so actually using time-tested practice of audit is, is very, a very responsible thing to do to build confidence. If in fact you want to stay in the dark corners, and you don't want any light, you resist audits. I will tell you, audits are important, but there is a practice called canvassing. And you can't canvass across the entire country, but you can canvass in those precincts and counties where there have been some irregularities. And a canvas is a matter of distort knocking to make sure that the person who cast the ballot actually exist, existed. And so you go and you knock on doors at addresses and you try to match up the data. Uh, and so I think a combination of canvassing and audits are essential to boost the confidence of voters in the results. Resistance to canvases and audits would suggest that somebody's trying to hide in the darkness. And that's why you see so many people now getting fired up demanding audits and canvases. Ken, we've got just a couple seconds left. Is there anything else you feel like we should walk away with on this topic, how we should be engaging in our local communities and, and for the online audience as well? Get involved in your precincts. The great uh, Satchel Page once said, and I'll, I'll set it up by telling you that st I have studied uh, a human phenomenon called, called homeostasis. We all like to, and that means equilibrium, we all like to feel in balance. We don't like to be out of balance. Well, sometimes you can become comfortable in a stale status quo. We can't be comfortable in a stale status quo. We have to take the risk from freedom. Frederick, I mean, uh, uh, Satchel Paige said this, for all you baseball fans, 
He said, it's very difficult to steal second base if you want to keep one foot on first base. And I will just tell you, it is in fact real difficult to demand freedom if you're not willing to fight for it. Let's fight. Mm. Mm. Very good. Thank you.